the upside generally in the world governed by blockchains, I think is massive and still suffers from a lot of people thinking it's scams, a lot of people overwhelmed and uncertain about the, the, the risks or what, what it actually is. And so for those of us who are kind of in the world, have seen the tech, have seen the p- potential of it, I feel like we're just sitting on this huge secret that not we're not even trying to keep to ourselves. We're just trying to tell everybody about it, and most people are still going, eh, I don't get it. And so let's just build, man. This is the Other Life Podcast. I am Justin Murphy. This week, we are talking with Jess Sloss. Jess is one of the lead instigators behind Seed Club. Seed Club is an incubator and an accelerator for tokenized communities. And what are tokenized communities? They're basically a certain type of decentralized autonomous organization. And in particular, tokenized communities really refers to communities often led by a particular creator where they create their own cryptocurrency and then use that cryptocurrency to organize and run the community. So it's a way of aligning incentives and creating all types of new relationships and economic games that can be played. So fans are now becoming more like investors and investors can become more like co-producers. And all of these roles are being intermingled in fascinating and really productive ways because really this is about unlocking value and distributing value. So it allows creators and creator communities to do much more significant and interesting and financially powerful things in new ways by leveraging these these internal community tokens. And so I'm very bullish on this. There are a lot of creators and communities now out there that are doing this successfully where the value of the token rises over time because it reflects genuine long-term sustainable value creation. It seems to be a win-win for everyone involved, and I'm just super bullish on it. But I'm also trying to learn deeply about how it works, the do's and the don'ts, what what works and what doesn't work, what we might want to try in my community and what we should avoid. And so I wanted to bring Jess in because he's got a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of experience. He's just seen a lot in this space. And so we go deep in this episode about the role of fungible tokens versus non-fungible tokens. We talk about the role of liquidity in tokenized communities, how to think about liquidity. We talk about securities laws and some of the risks involved, some of the best practices when it comes to how you should think about, but also how you should talk about these things to not, you know, brush up against securities laws. And then we also just talk about a whole bunch of other really specific tactical things when it comes to what the current playbook looks like for developing tokenized communities in this new way. So it was really interesting and I hope you find it both stimulating, but also practical and useful because as you know, we are rolling out our own ERC 20 token for the other life community. It's actually already out there. I have been giving it out to some people. Maybe you have some yourself already. It's called life hashtag or I'm sorry, cash tag money sign L I F E. And so I'm going slow and being very careful with what we do with it exactly. I want to have a really clear mental model of the vision and what we're really trying to accomplish with it before I really start hyping it. But I have been slowly rolling that out and and distributing it in recent weeks. So yeah, this is part of the research effort towards that. So hopefully you'll find this illuminating and useful to that end. So all right, that's about all I got. If you want to check up on Jess's work, you can go to seedclub.xyz or you can hit him up on Twitter. He's a nice guy. He's very approachable. He loves talking about this stuff, and he's at that tall guy on Twitter. So that's at sign that tall guy on Twitter. Just loss. All right, let's get to the show then. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. This episode is sponsored by IndieThinkers.org. IndieThinkers is a private membership community dedicated to independent intellectuals, intellectuals working outside of institutions and on the internet instead. So if that describes you, you should check it out. It's just IndieThinkers.org, and there's a link in the show notes. You can request an invitation. All right. All right. So, Jess, you are one of the instigators behind Seed Club. Seed Club is an incubator and accelerator of tokenized communities. These are communities that use mostly Ethereum ERC-20 tokens to align incentives and circulate value within the communities. So I'm super excited to talk with you and learn hopefully as much as possible about what you've learned in this really interesting space, because I think this space is much larger and more impressive than a lot of people realize. And I think Seed Club has played a role in many of the most successful tokenized communities. So why don't we just start with, would you please give my audience a quick overview of just how long have you been working with Seed Club? Give us the kind of founding story, what exactly you do with communities, and just a kind of high level overview of your track record and accomplishments so far with, with Seed Club. 
Sure. Yeah. Uh, C club started September of last year and, uh, emerged like I think many good tokenized community projects out of a, a telegram chat. Um, so we had, had seen a few projects, um, like the, the jam token and Alex mass match token, uh, boy from, from Matthew Vernon, uh, just these early experiments of, of using tokens to, you know, whether personal or, or unlocking community capital. Um, but they started taking off and I think they took off because there was a couple of new primitives that were launched. You know, it was very easy to launch a token, but tools like Collabland made it easy to gate access to a community, which kind of added some utility. And then, you know, the, the broad um, sort of growth in automated market makers made it possible for these really low volume tokens to have um, liquidity and, and a price essentially. And so we saw that, but being so early, realized that most people had more questions than answers, even the people who had launched them. And so we started a Telegram group that was really just focused on, on learning faster together. Um, and over the last you know eight ten months, we've been able to grow that into a fully formed DAO that lives on Ethereum, where we have sixty two member owners and um, you know some some capital and a bit of a track record under under our uh, our wings from from some work over the last little while. You know we still hold true to the, the belief that our main purpose here is just to learn faster uh, together, and so uh, we back projects. Uh, through an accelerator program, as you talked about, uh, we've done two cohorts early on. We worked with projects that had a, already launched, like RAC and Alex Masmage and Forefront and some uh, some of the Gitcoin team. Um, and more recently, um, I ran a batch this spring, of which we have a few tokens out, um, but most of them are still yet to come. Um, we use all sorts of tokens within our community, so ERC twenties, seven twenty ones, or, or NFTs. Um, and really, I think what's unique about us is we take a, a very creator or, or community focused approach where we're looking to figure out what the actual use case is, what they're trying to build for, and then see how we can use tokens to achieve that goal rather than sort of um, predetermining what an economic model might be for a community and, and how, how that might um, best form. So I think if people are looking to to see what some of the communities we've had our fingers in out, out in the wild right now, they can have a look at SquiggleDAO, they can have a look at Forefront, uh, Global Coin Research is a media company that's really leaning into tokens. The jump community if you're into brand marketing and looking for what a b2b token might be like um and then i think next week i guess i don't, shouldn't be it should be careful with timing here i don't know how quick you are justin but uh beginning of july you'll see song camp um launch a, a second version which is kind of a very interesting community around making music together um we're also working on a sort of we have a studio program where we work really closely with a, a smaller number of projects to help bring community tokens to the space. And that's still pretty early, but we're pretty excited about the progress we're making there. So my hope is by the time people listen to this or maybe re-listen to this, we're going to have a very different world in the social token space. Okay. Fascinating. And for people who maybe don't know much about this space, you know, I think there, there can sometimes be a mistaken impression that this is really, really early stage, undeveloped. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. But these are kind of just like toy projects, but when you look into it, it's really not, I mean, there's y'all are doing some, some big numbers. Could you give us a sense of what metrics you consider most important or most revealing when it comes to what you're doing? I mean, maybe market caps, give us, give us some details. Cause I think a lot of people would be surprised. I think, so that's actually a really great question. And one that I think there isn't a really great answer to, but, uh, and I think you can both be surprised by the scale and also uh, on both ends. So, you know, at, as the market was peaking, you know, a month or so ago, we were seeing social token projects with multiple hundred million dollar market caps. Um, I think the um, the big question is like, is that a really a fair metric? And and the answer is probably not, but also it's interesting, um, and I think can show like the potential scale of one of the biggest benefits I think that comes from tokens is that these communities all of a sudden have a cap table, and then that cap table while maybe not fully realizable in a, in, a, in a cash way, is still a very valuable asset that a community has that it can direct towards investing in or bringing people in or giving ownership to. Um, you know, I think we're seeing community numbers in the small you know, tens being very valuable all the way up to multiple thousands. Um, I think this, so it's always able, like the scale on the, on, the, um, on the low end might be a bit shocking in that some of the biggest tokenized communities are only a couple thousand members strong and, and they probably uh, have a, a far smaller number of them that are really daily active on a, on a regular basis. Um, so we're seeing large market caps without massive, massive communities. And I think that's actually a pretty bullish thing. Um, but more broadly, I don't, I don't think we have a really good number to, to measure these things. Um, and, you know, there's just a lot of ways that you can really manipulate these numbers to be in your favor. And so I, I, I truly, I think to your broader point, like, yes, there are, you know, uh, 
hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars worth of sort of tokens that are in this space. Um, but to really get a sense of like the value, I think we should not be looking just at underlying market cap value or, or even numbers that are in there. But ultimately, I think we're going to come up with better better metrics, which will probably be closer to value created. We'll see some sort of revenue or profit type number that, that will uh, ultimately be more meaningful. Okay, fair enough. I appreciate your your modesty, and uh, you know you, you're very you're very honest, and you're not trying to you know shill too hard. So I, I I applaud that. So let let me do it for you a little bit because I I mean some of these numbers are are extraordinary. Like if you look at like the whale token, for instance, I don't know if you work with them or not, but th- that's a market cap of like forty eight million. I think also you do work with friends with benefits. That's another one of the big ones. So just for people listening, uh, I you know these these are like really sometimes quite quite significant uh, projects with a lot of value locked in them. So, yeah, okay, I think so, that's going to be more the norm than, than not. I think we'll see a lot of long tail stuff, but we, the, I think, you know, we're working with, uh, with probably six or 10 projects right now that are going to be at that level. And so I think we're still very early on. And also you're right. Those numbers are significant. Right, right. So, okay, Jess. So you alluded to a minute ago about how when you start working with new creators or new communities, you really try to support them in the direction of what their goals are. And so that seems to kind of allude to a few different models that are kind of currently popular. I'm, I'm curious, could you give us a, a, some kind of, you know, taxonomy of what really are the the major options? You know, what's what's the menu of of social token communities? What are the different types of directions people are going with this? Because we have a lot of people in my audience who are creators or writers. And I think a lot of people would love a little bit of help thinking through what are the different pathways for doing this kind of thing? Yeah, I think there's a few ways to answer that question. Maybe, maybe the, the one that first comes to mind is just thinking about like doing it on the open web or doing it on a platform. So like, where am I going to issue a token? Um, open web is where we play mostly. This is like um, spinning up your own, you know, minting your own ERC-20 token using tools like Gnosis or, or uh, Snapshot. Um, these tools that are broadly available within the Ethereum ecosystem to uh, to manage a community, manage a DAO, you know, provide liquidity on Uniswap, et cetera. Um, you know, those are uh, lead to a certain type of project and, and are, are you know, good fits for a certain type of project. And I think those projects are ones that are, you know, really taking this, um, l- looking at this almost like a startup, like you're, you're really you know, launching a membership site, launching a tokenized community that it has a, a tradable token that people can go buy and or, or earn, um, where people are putting real time and capital into is a, a fairly big responsibility. And so, um, you know, I think there's big upside there. And also there's a, a bunch of effort that's required. Um, on the flip side, you might look at something like BitCloud, right? Which I think has a, a interesting brand reputation right now, but ultimately what it has done is made it extremely easy for anybody to launch a token. In fact, they even launched a token for you, even if you didn't want it, which maybe speaks to the, the challenge of their brand a little bit. Um, but you know, th- these are more um, bonding curve based issuance. So you're not just minting all the tokens and distributing on them kind of in a more equity like structure that uh, like a, a project like whale or FWB has, um, but um, more yeah, you know, it's on a bonding curve. So the, as you buy it, the price goes up, and as you sell, the price goes down, and most of the equity or, or liquidity is locked in this bonding curve. Um, so Big Cloud being that, and I think Rally um, is sort of the other big player in the space where um, they've made it removed a lot of the UX challenges to get on board, made it easier for consumers to get on board, um, and also have reduced a lot of the complexity from a creator standpoint, so that you're not having to think through designing an economy. You sort of inherit uh, the design of an economy, and there are certain ways to to win and, and, and to use those tools effectively. Um, and, and my expectation is for the vast majority of creators um, and maybe individuals who are going to use tokens, you'll probably be using it within a platform, one that has an economic design that supports the, the type of outcome you're trying to create. Uh, while there'll be a far fewer, but I think probably where, where a lot of the value is gonna be captured on a community standpoint, will be in more of the open web, you know, composable communities that tie into DeFi, tie into all the innovation that's still happening out in, in Web3. Okay, so that's one major choice or design decision do you want to go with bonding curves and a more kind of controlled curated designed system that perhaps has some some benefits or advantages or do you want to go more openly transparently and kind of reveal more of the 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 details in in the in the open market so yeah, okay so that's one but I, I wouldn't say it's about transparency so much it's just about the um, you know, if, if you do it in the way that say FWB has done it, there is a 
pool of tokens that live within the DAO that can be used and allocated as the DAO seems fit, much like it might have Ethereum or other other capital in it. When you're dealing with a, a building on a bonding curve, it's purely the, the price of the tokens is based on supply and demand along a essentially a, a supply issuance curve. And so the what you, what you don't have for the most part is a, is a pool of capital or, or of tokens that you can sort of invest in it. And so uh, into the growth of your community. Instead, you're really trying to um, create utility design. It acts much more like a currency within the, the economy. And usually a platform is going to be rewarding users within the uh, the platform for, for doing certain actions. Um, so there's fundamental economic designs differences and, and they can be transparent both, but you're, you may be right in that the open web is a little bit more open right now. Okay. Gotcha. That's a, that's a great distinction. And do you see value or analytical leverage in distinguishing between, let's say, a creator DAO versus a community DAO or, or even, I mean, this difference between when we talk about tokenized communities versus DAOs, there's not a strong line between them. Is there? Not really. And I think, um, I was just having a, a great debate about this in my call previously. It, like, I think these words are useful in that there's small differences in intent and structure, but that probably once we zoom out and look in, into the future, they probably aren't that different. Um, I think like the difference between a community and a, and a DAO is really like, do you have a governance process in place? In my opinion, like you can have a community token that, um, you know, let's look at like a, a, a BitCloud community, right? There, there, there's no real governance process in place for any of those communities. And yet there's a token. And so um, I would say there's a distinction there, but yeah, not okay. much. Okay, great. Gotcha. Just that, that that's helpful clarifying some of the basic terminology for people so they're not confused. So in your role with Seed Club, you have been exposed to a whole lot of variation, a whole lot of experimentation. And so I would really love to unpack a little bit what you've been finding, just your, your observations and findings around what is related to the successful creation of tokenized communities versus the less successful projects in your view, do you feel that there is a particular predictor of success? Like what's the most important variable that's most likely to predict a successful outcome when it comes to growing a token tokenized community? Yeah. Great question. So I, I think the, the, the caveat here is we're about a year into this space. And so a, a saying that we use often is it's really easy to create a token, really hard to create a valuable token. And how do we create a long-term valuable token? Um, and so I think that's, that's important context. Um, we're seeing, obviously seeing certain, certain, uh, indicators. I think, um, one is like, we really look for proof of community, um, which is a pretty broadly defined term in our world, but, um, it's probably the biggest determiner. Like, are there people who want to come together around this digital asset or are there not? And you can have an audience that uh, is large, but not have any community and also have, uh, you know, not have a valuable token because of that. Um, I think there's, uh, these stats also kind of get skewed because it's very easy to, I think, get people in and excited about a digital asset when the story is, it's going to go up, it's only going to go up, but really it isn't until you see a big drawdown on the market where you sort of start to see like what is underneath these things. And I think we've sort of seen that in the last little while. So proof of community can mean there's 10 people that are super stoked. It can mean there's 10,000 people that are super stoked, but a 10,000 person um, discord doesn't necessarily mean that there's community there. And so we're still really working through how to, how to best um, figure that sort of stuff out. Um, and I think the, you know, we're still seeing, I think a, a premium on people who are doing something interesting in the space. It's pretty easy to copy something, uh, but there's usually something missing in the copying. I think it's, we can see it across, you know, many other different creative endeavors. And so the, 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 the I'd say like the, the strong alignment with a why that is really meaningful to that community seems to be essential as well. So like we're, we are using this asset in the pursuit of something rather than, um, you know, I think there's a, a lot of more recent token exploration that's purely around like the, the speculation on the future fame or popularity of a creator or a community or, or a brand. Um, and I think that's just probably not going to stand the test of time quite to the level where, uh, folks that are really seeing this as like a superpower, a token as a superpower within their community that they're trying to use to some better outcome or bigger outcome or, or, or result. Um, so those are two things that we're, we're really looking at. Um, I, I think there's still like, a lot to be figured out. Um, and I think we still haven't seen what, like the things that we're spending a lot of time thinking about right now is how do we deal with communities that have much larger scale? Um, because there's a whole other level of challenge when you have a million people in a 
community audience, but like, you know, a meaningful one that we're then trying to introduce into Web3 and bring into token ownership or participation. Um, and you sort of have a big challenge in, in introducing that to the right people uh, without there being a dilution of what that actual value is when you try to coalesce a community and without there being just a huge influx of speculators. Uh, because the, the big challenge and fear that I see on most creator faces that I talk to that are thinking about launching a token is thinking that it's going to look like any of the DeFi telegram groups where it's just everybody asking when moon and people saying that I put my life savings in here and I'm not going to be able to make my mortgage payment and all sorts of weird stuff that is like very, very much not what people want to sign up for. Right. It's almost like the the risk, there's a greater risk in the token going up in value too rapidly than it going down in value. A hundred percent. And one of the, uh, yeah, one, one the, the launch process and the distribution process is something that we're doing a lot of work on. And, and I've really leaned into NFTs as kind of an, an intro point there. It sort of acts as a way of being able to, um, so there's this magical feeling of being given ownership or given a token that represents ownership in something, um, or being given a token. I mean, I know there was, um, you know, being gifted a token and feeling like, oh, wow, that's like, there's, it feels different than if say you sent me money, right? Uh, there's like a different, a, 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 a emotional connection that kind of comes from that. And so I think the, you know, what, what we really want to do is, um, lean into, into that. And I think, um, but without exposing us to the full price fluctuations of maybe a tr freely tradable token. And so you can do that through a, not having a market for your token to start off with, right? So you're doing distributions prior to there being liquidity, or we also use NFTs to do that where we're maybe selling some NFTs, but, and also giving some away to be able to more handpick the types of people that we want to have form the nucleus of the community before we then may airdrop tokens that are fungible to those, those NFT holders, and then scale out more of a, a tokenized community beyond that. Okay, that's fascinating. Actually, we may, we might want to pause on this and and double click on that because as you know, I'm I'm slowly carefully rolling out my own social token. I'm very interested in this. I'm very bullish on this in a larger longer term way. But in the short term, I'm basically just moving very slowly, doing a lot of research, a lot of thinking. I don't have any kind of short term um goals really other than to experiment with the space. I have some plans and ideas for sure, but I'm basically just talking to a lot of people like you, really trying to absorb all the all the best practices and knowledge and reflecting on where this could go or should go. And I would love to hear a little bit more about this NFT, the NFT logic, how NFTs mix in with the social tokens. Um, so maybe you can unpack what you mean by how to leverage NFTs uh, in a clever way in the early stages. Let's talk tactically and, and concretely. Sure. So I think like NFTs, are interesting to me for a number of reasons, but probably the most interesting is how easy, it, how we now have a tool to generate on-chain revenues for these tokenized communities. So I really think there's a big sort of no man's land between like web two and meat space legal world and, and the banking system and, you know, DAOs or community tokens, which are essentially like, I think our, one of our collaborators, uh, Cooper Turley defined DAOs as a, community with a shared cap table and bank account, which I think is super interesting and it's on chain. And so NFTs really allow for two things. One, the generation of, of capital or revenue on, in, into a shared bank account, which is an on-chain address. Um, and then two, a, a more, I guess, um, yeah, strategic way of being able to slowly build out an initial ownership base of, of your DAO or participant base of your DAO. So, um, what you can have, maybe as an, as an example, uh, Lil Michaela is a, a project that's, uh, from the Bread team. They are the guys that are behind FWB. And I think what we're seeing, though they haven't really come out and said, this is like an early view of, of a strategy that'll probably be used quite a bit. Uh, so back in, in, uh, the fall, they issued a one of one NFT and sold it on super rare. And I think it was 50, 60, $70,000 at the time that went into, uh, the, you know, this little Michaela owned ETH address. Um, and then over the last few months, the, the little Michaela team has been running contests on Twitter, which is essentially giving people a way to like say, Hey, I want to be part of this community and has, has been given away thousands of, of NFTs. And my guess is that you're going to see those NFTs represent early access into, um, a little Michaela DAO or a little Michaela uh, community. Now I don't have any inside information on this. This is just speculation on my point, but it's uh, something I think we'll, we'll see moving forward quite a bit. Um, 
you know, so that's sort of one. On, on the flip side, with what we did with Squiggle DAO is we actually used uh, an existing NFT collection as a way of like bootstrapping a DAO. So we said, if you hold a Squiggle, which is an on-chain generative art piece from the Artblox platform, which we knew had a strong community already, they're just uh, that was probably right for us to help to focus a little bit, that you could gain access to a, our Discord. And then once uh, we gave people an opportunity to join the Discord and we started talking about it quite a bit and we had about 600 people join, we took a snapshot of all the members who were part of that Discord and airdropped them squig tokens, which are the, the DAO governance token. And so it was a way for us to sort of, you know, I think if you think about uh, there being too many people on the internet to bring in a meaningful way to collaborate in a DAO, how can you slice that that community up into like a, a, a high value, um, you know, strong overlap between, you know, alignment with your goals and, and the ability to help move towards those goals and then distribute ownership tokens to, to that smaller slice as a base point to be able to build off of. Okay. Fascinating. Yeah. Th those are good concrete examples. So something I'm curious about is how the, these different items and the different addresses are combined or not combined. So if a creator or community launches an NFT sale, let's say to, to, you know, initiate or launch, you know, a community token or something like that, or essentially raise, it's essentially kind of raising a bit of capital to kick things off. Is it like the sales from that NFT are going into the community treasury? Or are they going somewhere else? Are they, are they providing liquidity for the token or how, how does, how does that work? What kind of patterns are you seeing that are the coolest and most effective and interesting? Yeah, I think both of those are, you know, one, we're most excited about is, is providing a group of people with, you know, some capital to be able to, to to spend on growing a community. And so putting, you know, auctioning off NFTs or selling NFTs or even curating a marketplace of NFTs using something like Zora, I think are really exciting ways of generating revenue for, for these DAOs that can then, um, you know, be spent on, on useful things. Um, you know, if there's the squiggle DAO world, like, we, one of our core efforts there is to help launch new generative artists on chain and so and earn some some you know part of the collection and part of the revenue for doing it so I think that's um, and, and there's obviously costs that go along with it and so being able to, to support the development work etc are, are, are kind of key to that um, we do see a lot of token issuances or at least uh, yeah, some NFT sales going towards providing liquidity. So there's a digital lax, um, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but a token that was out at the beginning of this year where the entire NFT sale was went to providing liquidity for the, the token pair. Um, we're not seeing a whole lot of that. I think what, one interesting thing is, is we are often pretty big supporters of delaying liquidity for a lot of these tokens until there is sort of a baseline um, level of participation and ownership and culture stood up there um which is i think a little bit different than a lot of the earlier social tokens that launched pre-hype i think yeah right now there's just a lot of people paying attention to it and as soon as you have um a liquidity pair um especially it was probably going to be fairly thin if there's any hype around it prices can get out of whack pretty quickly so uh but I, but i do see you know nfts as being a path to generating some liquidity as being interesting it's still a pretty big area that is i, I think lacking the the best solutions just yet okay fascinating that, that makes a lot of sense though nfts as a kind of less risky uh sh initial way of of accumulating some revenue without we look at it like selling digital merch basically right like you might want to sell right. merch through something like metafactory that's another way of generating on-chain revenue but what's really unique around selling nfts is that you can have like the marketplace or the the account be owned by your multi-sig, right? So the money will ultimately, or you know, publishing on Mirror, doing a crowdfund on Mirror. These are all things that 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 capital goes directly into your multi-sig, and there's no, you know, need for intermediaries, etc. Okay, excellent. So I understand the logic for being careful and going slow on liquidity, but what do you see as the 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 best uses of liquidity? Like when what is when is the right time to organize liquidity and what what are the most interesting and compelling use cases for that? So like in our ideal world, liquidity is something that is demanded and sort of driven by the community. And so you have holders there that are like, you know what, we want to have liquidity stood up. And so we're going to go make that happen. And the community kind of rallies around it. I think that makes the most sense from a, a legal standpoint. And then also from like a, a timing standpoint, it's essentially being pulled out of the community instead of it being pushed on them. Um, the reasons why is that, you know, that a lot of people who are a lot of the unlock and having a token in these tokenized communities is being able to pay people in these 
tokens essentially. So you're being rewarded in your community using the community token for doing work for the community. Um, and you know, ultimately if people are actually using this as a main source of work, which for projects like FWB or uh, whale, you know, I think whale has a number of, of moderators that at, at the market peak, were earning close to $15,000 worth of, of whale tokens every month for doing moderation jobs that only six or eight months earlier was, I think tokens were worth about $150. So there's like real earning opportunities here. And so being able to have, you know, the ability to, to turn that into some other sort of asset is, is kind of key to be able to ensure people are able to capture value from the value they're creating in these communities. Okay, great. So that's that's really the main benefit of liquidity and the real the real purpose of it is being able to leverage the token to actually mobilize other people's labor within the community because the liquidity is what gives it a real market value. 100%. And I, and I think there is also sort of like a, you know, a, a, an interesting relationship with speculation in these communities in that, um, you know, we, we very much design to, to avoid speculation. Most of the assets we launch are, are very clearly not, you know, claims on capital or rights or their governance votes, et cetera. Uh, but some people do speculate on them and, and that speculation does drive a market price and that market price does have, you know, value that gets captured by all token holders. So there's sort of a, a yeah, a love hate or a love challenge relationship with all that sort of stuff. But ultimately getting to a point where there's broad, deep liquidity across all these social tokens, I think is a net benefit and, and a huge unlock for the space. And I think we're maybe one social token focused AMM away from really seeing that unlock be meaningful. Excellent. And how do you advise people to think about and speak about the legal issues? Because there are some kind of thorny legal issues when it comes to token communities. There are, of course, securities laws, and you have to be very careful to not, you know, frame your social token project as a security because that would be illegal. And yet there's it's awkward because a lot of what people want to do with these tokens and a lot of what people do actually do with these tokens, which is most interesting, does kind of brush up against the line of, of what of what a security is. So how do you think about that challenge? And do you have any rules of thumb for both thinking about that in a way that's legal and, and honest and, and, and safe, and, but that is also able to convey the, the most exciting aspects of this. So like an example would be like, you know, people like you and, and, and other people in the token community space will very commonly talk about the benefits of tokens to, you know, distribute the value uh, to, to, to the community. And, and it is it is in a way, an informal way of basically sharing equity. And you'll you'll hear some people talk about the word equity, you know, and yet you do have to be careful because you don't want to talk about that too much because then it starts to sound like security. So it's very, it's quite vexing to talk about the real promise of these things, which is, which is so exciting and is real, but without overselling it and without crossing legal lines. So I'm just curious, you must've thought about this and what kind of rule of thumbs, rules of thumb you have. Yes. I've thought and spoken a lot about it. So I, I think, you know, the way I approach it is, is really just trying to put everything on the table. And so that, that the projects we work with fully understand, um, the, the landscape or, or, you know, to the best of our abilities, essentially. And I think, you know, the, the reality is the crypto space generally is in a very big gray zone. And so the, the idea of, you know, especially if we look at DeFi tokens, which I think have significant market caps and, and have launched in, in a similar way to many social tokens where, you know, um, you know, they're, they're launched and airdropped and a value is created because somebody has created a market pair and, and they're being used to incentivize and reward activities within these uh, ecosystems. Um, and, and yet, you know, there, and so it's, I think, generally seen as the right way to go do these tokens. And yet we haven't really seen any legal challenges or, uh, and definitely don't have really clear regulatory um, guidelines or frameworks for it. And so I think what you're seeing is um, the space is being pushed forward by two things. One, the reality of the tech, the tools are here. It's very easy to do something. And we're going to see thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of these tokens out in the world. Uh, and, and two, that the people who have done the more innovative things and kind of pushed forward without needing a requirement for clarity, um, have created a lot of value. And so those two things I think have led people to really lean in and, um, just, uh, build momentum, take action in lieu of what I think from a legal standpoint, a purely conservative legal standpoint would probably make most people stop, um, and be like, okay, I don't really have enough clarity to, to step forward here. And so, you know, I think as far as 
um, you know, what we're, we have a couple guidelines, right? One, we, we don't ever sell tokens. So the, we're really excited about NFTs as merchandise and being able to, to sell, um, you know, one of one collections and art and collectibles, uh, but selling ERC 20 tokens to in investors or to your community is something that is, um, you know, generally seen as being a little bit more on the risky side. Um, I think the, the big question that we're all sort of wondering about is like, what, what is effective decentralization in, uh, in a DAO? And, you know, if a community is, is coming together and all being active on governance and, and proposals are coming from holders who, uh, may not be a part of a core team or, or just sort of broad members of, of this community, um, and, and they then want to vote on, say, making a token non-transferable or non-transferable token transferable, or for some cases, maybe some of these DeFi tokens where all of a sudden tokens that are governance may now have a claim on, on revenue. Um, how, how should we judge whether a community is decentralized enough to, to make that bet such that we're less likely for it to be considered a, a security? And the reality is we don't quite know what that answer is. So, um, it's a long winded winding way of saying we try our best to show that we are very good actors, that this is not, you know, that there's no cases of fraud, that we're trying to be very clear about what the utility and purpose of these tokens is, where the limitations of these tokens are. We're not trying to sell tokens. We're trying to really line up as many things to say, hey, we're trying to do this the best as we possibly can. And also knowing that the regulations are, are incomplete here and, and allow, giving us sort of good guideposts to, to do it court, like with all T's and, and I's crossed. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you're basically just kind of acknowledge that it's this is a legal gray zone. It's it's kind of intrinsically the the frontier and all you can do is act in good faith and do your best do the best you can to be honest, clear at all times and okay, I like that. I mean, it, yeah, th there might just not be any uh particularly clear and fast rules for this. You just have to basically navigate yeah, honestly I think the, and in good faith. The clear and fast rules really are, are along the lines of like, and, and they're still clear-ish and fast-ish rules, um, but are, are really just taking like the existing corporate structures in the United States and applying a DAO to them. So if we look at the, the great work that the Lao and uh, Flamingo DAO are doing, and even some of the work that's done out of Wyoming, what they're trying to do is say, okay, well, let's give the legal protection that a, an LLC would have to members of, the, of these um, organizations and then just allow them to have ownership over digital wallets and, and have some sort of governance structure that allows that to happen. Um, but the challenge is that, you know, our membership aren't all in the United States. Um, this wasn't, the, you know, the, the, the Genesis account was not launched in the United States. Uh, we have folks all around the world. And so where, where should this community live? And if you have tens of thousands of members in a EDM community that are all across the world and they all have small ownership stakes in these things, what, what is the appropriate jurisdiction for, for this shared wallet address to, to kind of find a home in? And so I think there's a bunch of real big thorny questions that we're all going to have to try to grapple with. Um, you know, we put a lot of time and effort into thinking through some of these things and, and are really eager to be a part of any discussions that help us clarify and find a good uh good home legal home for these uh these entities we see stuff happening in colorado around uh, the cooperative law structure there wyoming delaware and uh, british virgin islands are all taking some uh there's groups that are all pushing forward DAO legislation that we're hoping will allow all these tokenized communities to have a little bit more certainty do you think that these are avenues that U.S. based creators and community builders should be doing already, or is it kind of overkill and kind of too early for creators to to be doing? I'm, I'm alluding to things like open laws infrastructure for basically zapping your DAO into a formal legal structure. Are these things that you recommend, or not yet? Listen, I think that the right answer here is that if you're concerned about anything here, you should talk to your own lawyer. Um, my opinion is <laughs> yeah. that um, many of the existing legal structures in the United States limit what you can actually do with the tokens to a point where it probably doesn't quite make sense for you to do a token generally. Um, I think for those creators that are looking to be um, much more, you know, conservative in how they roll out a, a community, I think the two things I would say are one, NFTs are probably your big friend. Just make sure you're selling them as far as merch and collectibles, not as um, shares in your company. And two, um, I encourage anybody who's doing an ERC 720 token to, uh, look at, at locking down those tokens at least or at the very least not um, building a marketplace for those until there's a lot of traction and and sort of breadth that exists there or until somebody in your community goes ahead and, and does it for you and at that point it's kind of out of your hands okay okay fascinating so there's a lot of really concrete stuff here basically uh, 
err on the side of not selling tokens if you can. No need at this stage. Of course, talk to your lawyer, but in general, no need to go fully legal on these things in terms of incorporating your DAO in, in most cases and let things be community driven. I guess that kind of gives more of a case to the legitimacy of things. If it's like the community is pulling it out of you, that sounds a lot better and, and makes a lot more sense than if you're launching things for what could arguably be seen as more speculative purposes and be cautious on on liquidity and and making a market and then also using nfts as a safer um kind of an initial way of of selling collectibles to get some revenue into the mix yeah revenue versus investment i think is a good way to, to look at it there um so the, the interesting thing with tokens is that they are so malleable right we can do we can make them do what we want them to do and so you can have two tokens you know they'll look exactly the same but you know, a creator can say this token represents a share of, of the revenue that I'm going to generate on this video. And the other token represents the right to have a vote over what we do in our next video. One is, you know, the, the share of, of revenue is going to look a lot more like a security than, um, than, you know, one that's just a, a more of a governance token. And that's all said with the reality that we really, I mean, the shrug emoji is probably my, one of my most used emojis when we, when we talk about this sort of stuff, because, um, you know, we're still seeing enforcement actions from 2017 against pure frauds. Um, there are 10 times, a thousand times, a hundred thousand times, I don't know, more tokens that are going to exist over the next couple of years. Um, I just don't, it's, a, it's an interesting landscape to think through, you know, what that looks like as, as exponential growth comes to these spaces. Yeah, absolutely. Well, excellent. So th thanks for sharing all of that. So I'm curious when you look at the projects that maybe don't do as well as you would have hoped, you know, or tokens that just, or communities that kind of fizzle out that go nowhere or that just for any reason fail, I'm curious, are there, are there correlates of failure in this space? Like what are, what are the biggest predictors of, of projects that just end up not succeeding for any reason? Yeah. Well, when we talk next time, I think we're going to have many more examples of that. Just, I think we're, where we're at in the phase of, of social tokens generally, uh, the, the answer that comes to mind is really just, you know, there are these, these tokens or, or these communities require consistent effort and heartbeats and, and building of momentum. And so the ones that don't work are the ones where people have kind of walked into them, not fully thinking through what they want to do with it and not being fully committed to, to the process. Like I think if, if you've launched a token within the last year and you think that it's already proven to be a failure, um, my guess is you just really weren't in it for the right reasons or you didn't have a clear vision or, or enough of a reason to launch a token in the first place, which I get. Like I think there's a lot of um, you know excitement that happens in crypto and a lot of desire to uh, experiment and uh, you know a lot of tools that are saying, hey, it's just really easy. You should just come do it. Um, and you know, one of the things that we're very, very, very cautious of is, is scanning for that. Like tokens can last forever. The ideal timeline and time horizon to be building these communities, in our opinion, is an infinite time horizon. How you manage your treasury, um, you know, how you how you message about these sort of things. Like, uh, I think that, that's not to say that there isn't good reason for small ephemeral token launches and stuff like that. But I think make, being very clear around the intentionality of it is is essential. So the ones we've seen fail are ones where I think creators or communities were just being like, yeah, let's give it a shot. Um, didn't, didn't quite work. Weren't able to like iterate to, to get to the next level of, of interest, um, and decided to sort of close up shop. Uh, I think those that are continuously putting time and effort into them are, are still successes in my book, even if they're not like massive market cap tokens right now, because I don't think all of them need to be big, huge hundred million dollar market caps to have a lot of meaningful value for a creator in their community. Absolutely. I love it. That makes a lot of sense. I, that's definitely how I'm thinking about it. Super, super long term because there's so much hype right now and it's clear that, you know, the hype just goes up, up like crazy, but then it dissipates. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really long on all this stuff in, in the long term, but, um, yeah, I, so, so that's, that's music to my ears. Now you, you tweeted recently that there, that you think in the future, most companies are going to have NFT managers. I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, you said like blogs, newsletters, or Twitter accounts in five years, every company will have an NFT strategy as part of its media mix. So I, I'd love to unpack that a little bit. I'm curious what you think that would look like, or maybe better way to phrase the question is right now for the most avant-garde media companies, 
what what do you think is the most compelling NFT strategy, right? Because there's it goes back to what we're talking about with hype and, and everything in the short term, right? You're seeing these really big auctions where there's it's very clear there's a lot of kind of backroom dealing and you know people are getting you know there's a lot of wheeling and dealing in the background right and that's it's fine it's all good and it's cool to see these people like people throw up these massive numbers it's exciting and awesome but it also seems clear to me that uh, the long term value of something like NFTs for media companies is 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 way uh, way bigger and more subtle so I'm curious like if you're tr- if you're not interested in the hype but you really want to build for the long term and you want to orient your media company. Uh, in a way that's long for crypto in the future, what does an NFT strategy look like na- right now, concretely? Like, what would you recommend people do or think about? I mean, that's a, a huge question that I think uh, is absolutely fascinating. So, the the maybe I'll answer it in in really what my the intention behind that tweet was, which I think was to say that, um, you know, as we as communities or companies. We, we start somewhere and we grow and, and we start to build momentum. And, and right now we use blogs and Twitter and these places to tell our story. Right. And that was a big shift in web two, web one to web two was like, now we have this democratization of the ability to, um, to, to share media, to write, to, to tell our story. Um, and I think what we're going to see with this, with web three and NFTs is, is we're going to see companies start to, um, mint meaningful moments or media creations that represent their journey or their progress or their momentum. And so these are, I think artifacts is the right way to look at these. And so, you know, we're already, we, we see that happening. And when we look in the rearview mirror for, for companies like Apple or, or Microsoft or Google, right? Like maybe there's like the, the famous, um, you know, garage photo of people like working in them. And you can imagine that maybe in, in moving forward that organizations like ours are minting the first telegram message that happens or you know the the fundraising announcement or the first time you meet in real life and you're sort of building up i think it's about creating nfts that represent the progress of the organization not necessarily about selling them off and generating revenue i mean i would probably say you'd want to do both and think through how that would work but i think it's maybe the the contrarian take is thinking about minting as a as a creating a historical record rather than you know generating generating revenue and the point of that tweet is that I think it'll be that and, you know, how do you involve your community in, in creating, curating NFT collections and curating meaningful moments within your community or community or company as well. Um, partnerships, collaborations, et cetera. So this, this idea of being able to have, you know, uniquely owned digital media, I think is a shift that we're going to see smart entrepreneurs leverage. And we're already seeing early stuff of this. Like I think, uh, Brian Flynn from Rabbit Hole did a fundraising announcement last week, and and at the center is an NFT, and we don't know what he's going to do with that NFT. But my guess is that they'll do something interesting with it, and maybe it lives within his his collection forever, or the the Rabbit Hole DAO collection forever. But um, w- thinking through the things you can do with these primitives and tools that both um, you know drive some sort of metrics like collaboration or, or value creation or just capture the progress and history of, of an organization i think is really interesting to think about okay excellent yeah that that makes a lot of sense i'm curious what you there there are still some you know stalwart stubborn bitcoin maxi types out there who still are very skeptical of all of this as you can tell i'm, I'm clearly not i'm very very interested in in all of this i'm very bullish on all of this in the long term but i am curious what you say to the haters, because there are still a lot of them and, and, and they're sometimes quite vocal and aggressive. I mean, what, what do you say to, what do you say to the people who believe that everything that's not Bitcoin is literally a scam? I mean, what, what, do, what how do you think about that? And, and what do you say to those people? So I feel like I'm being set up here for, I think your community has a few Bitcoin maxis in it, right? Uh, listen, I, I think like, we have a few, but like, clearly think, I'm not. So yeah, feel, yeah. you should feel safe. <laughs> I do feel safe in my, in my worldviews. Uh, uh, a few things one like yeah bitcoin i'm a i'm a holder of bitcoin uh like it's what what an amazing technology right and also i think if you're sitting here today and not seeing the amazing innovation that's happening in across multiple other ecosystems you literally have your head in the ground and that's fine if you feel safer that way but like i just don't think it's a tenable position to have anymore um i think like what i take from it really is like this belief in, 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 you know, ultrasound issuance and the ability, the removal of anybody's ability to, to manipulate or, and I think that's the, the fair critiques. Like there are a number of fair critiques of the social token space. The number one, one being that there's like, you're putting a lot of power and trust into small groups of people that maybe haven't earned it yet, or 
that are have uncertain allegiances in the long term. And so you need to be very thoughtful about how you're participating in these communities. And there still is a ton of trust that's associated with this. And I think that's a feature, not a bug, but I think there are you know, theoretical limitations to scaling that come with it. And, and um, the bigger these communities get, the more meaningful a potential access cam could look like or hacks, et cetera. So there's very, very fair criticisms to be had there. But listen, I think you make a decision in life, whether you want to be in the arena or outside the arena. I think a lot of Bitcoin maxis are sitting in the stands, just shooting laser eyes at people that are running around uh, an arena, trying to do something interesting. And uh, I give huge props to anybody who's in the arena trying to figure stuff out. Hell yeah. Are you an ETH bull yourself? Do you think ETH is going to, is going to overtake Bitcoin? I mean, maybe, I don't, I haven't really thought that through. I don't, that's not super interesting to me as to whether it overtakes Bitcoin. I think like, I think it, ETH is, is undervalued today compared to like the huge economic value it's going to create in the future. I think Bitcoin is undervalued today compared to the huge you know, economic value it's going to create in the future. And, uh, you know, I look at the space as, as there, there's sort of two parallel economies developing with a huge border down the middle. And that's, you know, on-chain economies and off-chain economies. And there's innovation happening in both. I just think that the, for a number of reasons, the opportunity and potential and, and even potential scale and growth that comes from building on-chain today is far more interesting and, and big than, you know, playing in, in the existing ecosystem or, or economy. So um, the upside generally in the world governed by blockchains, I think is massive and still suffers from, you know, a lot of people thinking it's scams, a lot of people overwhelmed and uncertain about the, the, the risks or what, what it actually is. And so for those of us who are kind of in the world, have seen the tech, have seen the p potential of it. I feel like we're just sitting on this huge secret that not, we're not even trying to keep to ourselves. We're just trying to tell everybody about, it, and most people are still going, ah, eh, I don't get it. And so, you know, let's just build, man. The opportunity is very real here and only getting bigger, I think. Hell yeah. I mean, that's, that's what, that's kind of what I say too. It's like, I, I mean, in, I, I see some, uh, you know, reason in the arguments about why maybe Bitcoin would absorb all of the monetary premia in the very, very long run, perhaps. But in the short term, it's like, there are really cool things you can do with all these different tokens. And at the moment you can't do them with Bitcoin. Therefore, just do them with what you can do them with. You know, it's like, uh, I'm interested in like basically doing the coolest shit possible as soon as possible, as quickly as possible. So clearly you can't do that much with Bitcoin. So do it with what you can do it with. And to me, that's just like a kind of obvious argument, uh, whatever, you, whatever you think about, you know, abstract arguments about the very, very long term and monetary premium and all that. I totally agree with that. And also, so the thing that's been really interesting to, to see recently is like these uh, dog coins and like pure meme coins go crazy. And I think even meme stocks. And I think it's really, you know, so maybe like the, the IRL equivalent to Bitcoin maxis are like value, value investors. Um, and what is, I think interesting to see is that really maybe the ultimate use case for most of these crypto projects and maybe even Bitcoin itself, though this will probably get me in trouble is that is is more of like a, a bet on a brand and on a meme than, than anything else. And the meme part of it actually is what's driving most amount of value and of course in bitcoin i think like the the part of that meme is 21 million tokens and and like the soundness of of that ecosystem but um maybe that's not important generally right maybe all you want need to have is a group a large enough group of people who believe in the value of or the promise of this digital asset for it to have to have value and especially if they're able to use that to bootstrap something bigger you know, I, I don't, I do believe over a long enough period of time, like some sort of fundamentals probably matter a little bit. Like you can't just have never go up forever as much as those leading our economy tend to seem to indicate. But, uh, to, to me, like the biggest, the most bullish thing that's maybe the most bullish on social tokens is to see Shiba and save moon and all these other things that are pure memes grow significantly because I see that as like what we're building in, in, in social tokens is a, is a much more sound, strongly connected um, nucleus or fire that's just as it burns brighter and brighter i think we have this potential scale of some of these other meme coins but hopefully uh, some more meaningful meat on the bones hell yeah hell yeah so we covered a lot of ground this is awesome thank you for sharing all of your insights and observations are there any topics or observations or issues in the social token space that i did not ask about which maybe i should have or you know any particular myths you want to bust or insights you want to leave us with that maybe i didn't ask you about no i mean i thoroughly enjoyed this conversation i, I think the 
the, the, the biggest thing, I, I just think people need to go experience this stuff. And, and the way you can experience it is, you know, uh, join, join a DAO, go hang out with Bankless, go hang out with Squiggle DAO, or go join Forefront or Global Coin Research. Um, you know, if you go to C Club HQ on Twitter, you can join our Discord and we can connect you with any number of different communities that are the best places just to see what's going on. I, I think that the belief we have is that, you know, Web3 needs to be experienced, not just thought about. You, you, you can't understand why it is different to be gifted. Like when you gave me some of your tokens, that, that is a, a bond that's very different than if you gave me 50 bucks, 100 bucks, right? It, it's just, it's meaningful different. And you really can't understand what that is until you've participated or until you've earned a, a bonus for a, or a bounty for doing something or until you voted the first time. So I, I think like the biggest thing is how do you, I would encourage anybody who's remotely interested in this just to go join one of those communities. And, um, you know, Forefront has a bunch of bounties that are that are listed within its uh, website that you can go do and earn and be a part of the community without having to buy anything. And I think it's just the, the, the right way to go if you're intrigued in the slightest. So I would encourage your, your audience to go do that as, as soon as possible. Awesome. I love it. Yeah, people should definitely go check out those groups. You can check out Seed Club's Discord. You can also go to seedclub.xyz and learn more about what Jess is doing with C-Club. And of course, people can now also get involved in the, the early stage exploratory experimental life DAO, uh, which is, uh, you know, I've been talking about it a bit and it's been slowly rolling it out, uh, but that's now on Urbit. I think we're, I think we might be the, the very first token community that's being built on Urbit. There are other interesting projects like the Dalton Collective and, and experiments in this direction, but I think I'm the first one kind of, pl- kind of, using the the social token playbook as people like you just have have developed but on urbit so it's, it's an interesting experiment and we'll we'll see how that goes but of course people watching this or listening to this are encouraged to get involved with that so jess i just want to thank you once again for your time thanks for sharing your all of your knowledge so generously and uh, yeah i hope people go check out c club and uh, connect with jess if they want to thanks justin Hey, thank you so much for listening to the podcast. You made it all the way to the very end, so you must really like the show. In that case, I would be super grateful if you'd be so kind to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. All you have to do is go to otherlife.co slash review. That's otherlife.co forward slash review. And it'll send you an Apple Podcasts. Just leave a review. You can be honest. Tell me what you really think. I'd really appreciate it because it'll help other people find the show, and I'm really trying to grow out the podcast. So thanks for listening, and thank you for leaving a review. I really appreciate it.